Salam and peace. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. You're watching Muslim Network TV. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and uh, Muslim Network TV is always there 24 7 on Galaxy 19 satellite uh, covering the whole United States of America, north to south, east to west, <clears throat> Canada, as well as Mexico. You can also watch us on Apple TV, Amazon, Fire TV, Raku, and uh, download our app, Muslim Network TV, or visit our website, muslimnetwork.tv. <clears throat> and if you are into watching everything on YouTube, you can watch us there as well. But do remember to subscribe. Well, today we'll be talking about what goes on inside the White House and someone who has been there uh, consistently has written about it. Uh, those people inside the White House, their children and their parents, <clears throat> he's going to share with us what goes on there. Doug Weed uh, is welcome to Muslim Network TV. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Uh, Doug Weed is a New York Times best-selling author and an advisor to two American presidents. Doug has interviewed six presidents and first ladies, 19 of the president's children, and 12 presidential siblings. No presidential grandchildren, I guess. <laughs> Actually, I have interviewed <laughs> okay. presidential. Well, I, I take that back. I've had conversations with them. I wouldn't call them formal interviews. All right. All right. Well, the first presidential uh, child which I paid attention to was uh, <clears throat> Amy Carter. Uh, when I was starting reading papers and all that, her pictures will come out in the White House. So tell us, uh, how does White House actually operate? Well, it depends on the president because it takes on the personality of the president and some of them uh, are more open and some are more secretive and some are more domineering and some uh, are more congenial. So it takes on the personality very quickly of the president himself. There are some rituals that remain the same and there are staff that will remain the same uh, over the years. Uh, they grow older and they retire, but uh, some of them have a lot of experience uh, on staff at the White House. How many uh, approximate proportion of the staff who is uh, const consistently there instead of changing with each president? Well, I don't know the exact percentage. Uh, it, it would be small compared to the entire uh, uh, hires. Uh, the president, when he's first elected, there's about 5,000 positions he has to fill very quickly. And uh, so <laughs> it quickly absorbs everybody he knows and trusts and everybody they know and trust. And <laughs> they're all sucked into this uh, very rapidly. So it's a small percentage in terms of uh, that portion of the staff that's ongoing. But there's quite a number of them, the, the cooks, the lawns keepers, the um, Secret Service staff. Some changes are made with each president, but uh, some of the leadership stays on from president to president. So, so maybe 10 percent stays the same, more or less? Did you say 10? Yeah. 10. Oh, much more than that. Oh. <laughs> several, several hundred. <laughs> oh, several hundred. OK. Yes. And it, well, describe uh, a, a typical day in White House when there is no crisis. In fact, I should correct that and say several thousand for ex because there are other departments that stay with the president. For example, his correspondence. So there's a large number of people who read each piece of mail that comes in and make suggestions on how the president should answer that mail. And so some of them are permanent ongoing staffers. Uh, and what was your next question? So, so the presidential, you know, White House and the executive building altogether cannot have thousands of people there. Yes, 
they uh, they're they're scattered to different places. The White House mansion itself uh, sits on that property, and then just adjacent to it is the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, and quite a number of the staff work there. It's a very large building. At one time, it housed all of the U.S. government, and uh, then it became the War Department and. And then eventually it became an adjunct to the White House. And then you can connect an underground tunnels to the new executive office building, it's called. And that's located a block or so away. And that's a very tall building. Now, I can't remember if it's 10 or 12 stories tall, but it has a gymnasium and swimming pool and workout rooms and has many offices there. And then there are executive offices and other buildings that are less known around town. There's also the Blair House, and it's connected to the White House through underground. But above ground, let's say the, the president of Indonesia or King Abdullah of Jordan visits the United States, he will often stay uh, well, actually, King, King Abdullah, I visited with him when he stayed in the United States, and he took the whole top floor of a hotel, the Ritz-Carlton. But when it's a state visit, he would stay in the Blair House, which is right across the street from the White House. It looks like a very humble uh, 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 building or home. Uh, but once you go inside it, it's actually larger than the White House itself. It, the whole block is hollowed out, the square block, and there are many rooms and offices there. So it's quite deceptive. Uh, it, it's a lot bigger than it looks. Mm. So altogether, would you say the 20 percent of all White House staff stays in their position and about 80 percent get changed by the uh, whoever is the president? That may be true of White House staff, but then remember there's the whole government. So we're not calling the whole government. I mean, yes. there may be 300,000 employees at the Interior Department. So, <laughs> so there's, a, there's a lot of employees. Okay. So describe a, a typical day in White House when there is no news breaking, where there is nothing uh, uh, extraordinary happening around the world. What is a typical day like? You know, there is no such thing as a typical day <laughs> in the White House because something dramatic is going on at every moment. Uh, when I worked in the White House, uh, there would be a, a, a Hollywood actor uh, on one part of the White House grounds meeting with staff or promoting some special cause. There would be preparation for uh, a state visit. Their legislative affairs would be working on critical decisions being made on Capitol Hill about laws being passed. There would be scandals that others were juggling that no one in the public knew about. And all over the campus, if you would call it that, in the White House, there were dramatic things going on. And each event that the president does, if it's in the Oval Office or the Roosevelt Room, which is a conference room, or if it's in the old executive office building where there's an auditorium, each of those events, it could be on the South Lawn, uh, or, uh, and it could be in the Rose Garden outside, each of those events has what's called an action officer. And that person, man or woman, is in charge of the event and they will have to clear that event with uh, the political department, with legislative affairs department, with the secret service, with uh, the legal department. The, uh, the president has a very large legal office. I'm sure you've heard he has, there's White House counsel. That's very deceptive. <laughs> White House counsel is one person, but that office has hundreds of lawyers and at least hundreds of lawyers, hundreds of lawyers and at least 10 or so very prominent lawyers that work in the White House itself. Uh, I would think 10 in the West Wing itself that would work as lawyers. When the president gives a speech, it starts with the president and a speechwriter. 
who writes it and more than one usually and they work it over and they edit it and then it goes to many of the departments in the white house for example it goes to the office of public liaison and they'll look over this speech how does it impact muslims how does it impact catholics what impact does it have on african americans what impact does it have on r rural America, on urban America. It'll go to intergovernmental, which is a different department in the White House, and their people will look it over the speech and they'll say, what impact does this have on the governors of the states and their laws that are pending right now? What impact does it have on the mayor, on the chief of police of Los Angeles? They'll, they'll, they'll take on the mindset of these people and they'll analyze the speech. It will go to the National Security uh, Council and they will look over the speech for foreign affairs. Uh, what will the Chinese think when they read this space, speech? It will go to uh, the legal department, White House Counsel's Office, which we were just talking about, and they will read the speech and say, is the president breaking any laws? Is he saying something or suggesting something that's unconstitutional that violates the law and they will check it for that reason it will go to legislative affairs and they have quite a big office and they will look at it and they will say how is this speech going to help or hurt the bills that we have pending before congress that we want passed and it goes on and on there are 15 different departments and by the time each one has made their changes. The speech doesn't look anything like <laughs> what it originally was going to be. And that's why most of those speeches are so boring too. <laughs> okay. Okay, so when we talk about President Trump, I would like to ask this question, how did he deal with all of those department, 15 people looking at his speeches? <laughs> Describe, you say there is nothing called a uneventful day in White House, but when there is a real crisis out there, for example, a couple of days ago, Burmese military <clears throat> took over uh, the Burmese government dismissed Aung San Suu Kyi and took full power and charged her uh, that she uh, illegally brought in 10 walkie-talkies in the, in, the, in the country. Now, when something like that happened, what happens in the White House, uh, it, it, you know, in terms of development uh, observation and making a decision, who going to speak and what will they say? Well, something like that, uh, uh, that's uh, important enough, goes right to the president very quickly. And you can get in serious trouble if it doesn't. If you know something, something's happening, you're keeping it from the president. Uh, it, it can be quite serious. Uh, I remember uh, uh, there was a prominent uh, worker in, in humanitarian worker that was arrested in a foreign country and thrown into prison. And he was able to bribe a guard and get a message out that allowed him to go back to his hotel to get blood, high blood pressure medication so he wouldn't die in prison. And while he stepped into his hotel room, he called his wife and said, I'm under arrest. I'm in a jail. I don't think I'm going to last very long here. You got to get help. And then they took him, put him back into the prison. Well, his wife called me at the White House and I immediately alerted the president and I called the, the person who was uh, representing as ambassador for that country. He actually, at the time, was representing more than one country because we were in transition. And he said, well, we're not going to do anything. I said, OK, I'll, I'll tell the president what you said. He said, well, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> he said, uh, let, let me look into this. Let me call you right back. So when they know it goes to the president, they tend to act quickly. Hmm. All right. Uh, we'll take a short break, uh, Doug. But when we come back, I like to uh, know how a president like President Trump will deal with all those people giving opinion about his speech and how will he liberate himself from all of that. Uh, you're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. I am talking with a presidential historian, Doug Weed, and we'll be right back after these messages. Assalamu alaikum. 
My name is Adam. You remember me. I appeared in so many episodes that Sound Vision has put on the market. No matter what it oh, no. Hey, what's happening? Hey, oh, sorry. Lockdown is what it is. Well, continuing here, in this lockdown, Sound Vision never stops thinking about you, the viewer. We'll have to get back into production again, online and in line. Everybody in their own space, e even me. Although I'm stuck with Lenisa. Salam! <laughs> Salam! Salam! <laughs> I, know, I know, you were shocked too. Well, l let me continue. Uh, this, is, um, this is what I was going to say. Salam! 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 Cut! 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 <sighs> Finally, I get my own screen time again. Thank God. And so we invested in new equipment to bring you even better production with new songs and new singers and animations. Well, here are a few clips. And Sound Vision has brought all this into your home, making Islamic values and teachings easy. And if you know me, Adam, a multi-talented actor, <laughs> well, sometimes I'm an actor and, and the reporter and the... Oh, that's enough. Let's move on to the next section. Well, you can watch these new episodes on our new app at www.adamsworldapp.com. We have previews happening every day on Muslim Network TV. Sound Vision has been serving generations, moving and changing with the times. We are all faithfully connected. That is a huge blessing. Your donation helps keep these programs available now and into the future. We take this job of helping tomorrow's Muslims today seriously, and you should too. Today, we need your help. Children absorb and learn from everything they encounter. Make that wholesome, positive, grounded in our faith, Together, we can accomplish our goal of raising better Muslims, better neighbors, and better citizens. Please donate generously. It's an investment in our future. But to finish, let me tell you there are new scripts of my new mission. And it is something that I enjoy talking about. My new mission is Hey, Houston, we do not have a problem. <laughs> Salam, see you soon.
Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and we're talking with Doug Reed, a presidential historian. Um, You were, you know, tell us how President Trump's White House internally operated differently than the other presidents. Well, he's not a traditional politician, as you know. And so it was very, very different. For one thing, most uh, politicians who rise to the level of president have a huge uh, entourage with them. Uh, I wouldn't call it an entourage. It's like an army. (laughs) It's uh, hundreds, even thousands of people connected. Usually it's someone who's run for office. They've been a congressman or a governor or a senator. And in the process, they've raised a lot of money and in order to be successful. And so they have a network of people so, and they develop a relationship with those people. And those people develop a relationship with each other. And when that man or woman becomes president of the United States, this army of hundreds of people move into power with them and take these positions of power. So the president has this army to support him. Donald Trump did not have that. He had never served in government before. He came into office and he appointed some of his children in prominent positions. He could trust them. But most of the other people he appointed had no experience in government and had no relationships with the media, no relationships with uh, Congress, with senators and legislators. That was a great disadvantage for Donald Trump, and it made him very vulnerable. It was also an advantage because not only does the president have this army of supporters, they have him. And there's not much he can do if he violates and goes against the ethic and the agreed upon philosophy of this organic group of people, this entourage. They've they've spent years together and they trust each other. They work together and they influence the president and they have some measure of power over the president. Sometimes uh, when I worked in the White House, the president, well, I'd give you an occasion, we sat around a room and there were about eight people in the room and the discussion was whether or not the president should raise taxes. This was George H.W. Bush. Well, when he ran for president, (laughs) he said, (laughs) read my lips, no new taxes. So as we sat around the table, about seven or eight people. And you were there as well? I was there. And they said, uh, yes, you have to raise taxes. The Democrats are willing to work with us. If we'll raise taxes, they'll agree to the cuts that we want to make. You have to do it. He said, what about my pledge? And how are the people going to react to that? And they said, well, Ronald Reagan did it. Ronald Reagan promised not to raise taxes. But when he got in power, he did raise taxes. And I knew through the campaign that George H.W. Bush was very uncomfortable with his pledge. At one time during the practice debates, he stopped and they brought up this read my lips thing. He said, I'm not comfortable with that. And I said, well, Mr. Vice President, he was then the vice president as a candidate. I said, Mr. Vice President, you better get comfortable with it because you are associated with it. So at this meeting in the White House, again, I, I uh, underscored that. I said, Mr. President, this, you, you are just solidly linked with this statement. It will look like you've lied to the American people. And he's a person of great integrity. That really troubled him. Well, he went ahead and he raised the taxes. And a few weeks later, I was backstage with him at an event and we were alone. Uh, There were Secret Service men. It was like a big ballroom backstage. And he said, uh, how's it going out there? And he was deeply troubled. He knew that... uh, it was going to hurt him historically. Uh, So Donald Trump comes in without that kind of baggage. He can change his mind and change his position and flip on a dime. And it allowed him to accomplish many things he wouldn't have otherwise accomplished. And it also uh, helped hasten his departure. Mm. So so in future, we will blame you for read my lips line. (laughs) 
<laughs> I, I tried forward. my best. <laughs> <laughs> you for the president on that. Now, you, you mentioned uh, on your website um, about President Trump. He may be the greatest president in modern history. And, uh, uh, and Trump has achieved uh, unprecedented accomplishments as president. Uh, would you like to share, uh, elaborate a little more on that? Well, he's very competitive. And when he came into office, he wanted to do everything on the very first day, immediately. Uh, I could give you many examples. One is the energy independence. Six presidents sought energy independence. Gerald Ford, I had him in my home on two different occasions. He would have cut off his right arm if he could have had energy independence, which gives the United States so many strategic opportunities it wouldn't otherwise have. Ronald Reagan deeply desired energy independence. Six presidents couldn't get it. Donald Trump got it. Uh, presidents uh, came to power. There were hostages being held under George W. Bush and under Barack Obama, and nothing was done. Uh, the, the families of these hostages, there were 55 American hostages being held in foreign countries by foreign leaders for various reasons. And D Donald Trump wanted them out right away. And the State Department said, well, we can't. You go, why? Why can't we? Because if, if we, uh, we have to deal with these countries, they have their own reasons for keeping them as hostage. What are we telling the parents and the families of these hostages? We're telling them to keep their mouths shut. And that was the policy under George W. Bush and under Barack Obama. If your son or daughter was held captive as a hostage, they said, keep your mouth shut. If you go to the media, we can't help you because you're only increasing the value of the hostage. More will be taken, not less. So your only hope of your loved one being released is if you stay quiet and don't call attention to them and let us do our work. But it soon became apparent they weren't doing any work. They were using the silence as an excuse to avoid getting it done. And so the accumulation of 55 hostages, when Donald Trump heard about that when he became president, he said, this is intolerable. And one by one, he brought all 55 of those home. Some of them didn't come home, but of, of the 55 he brought home, and they're pretty remarkable stories. I could go on and on. I mean, Jobs, everything that Hubert Humphrey and Lyndon Baines Johnson ever wanted for the poor in America came true under Donald Trump. At one point in America, we had 13 million unfilled jobs. That's the population of the state of Indiana, to give you an idea. It was just a pretty remarkable example of accomplishment in a very short period of time. Tell me this. Um, <clears throat> you just described to us uh, when uh, a president writes a speech, it is starts with him and a speechwriter, and it goes through multiple departments and things like that, it changes substantially how President Trump will write his speeches. I doubt seriously if, if he allowed it to go through that process, but he, he would be influenced sometimes. I, I discovered when I went in and I interviewed him, I suspected from my previous experience in White House that it was much more calculated than it appears. It appeared that Donald Trump was just totally spontaneous. So I suspected it was more calculated. When I went in and I interviewed Donald Trump, I found that yes, it was much more calculated and sophisticated than I had anticipated. Uh, uh, John F. Kennedy once said, things don't happen, they're made to happen. And that's very true. Uh, important decisions, especially at that level, are made to happen. So Donald Trump had a style, uh, you could, uh, some people attribute it to the quote of Sun Tzu, uh, out of chaos comes opportunity, although other scholars say he never said that. But still, there, there is the point that sometimes out of chaos comes opportunity. Donald Trump would blow up NATO 
and people were outraged, but he rebuilt it stronger than ever after he was done, $150 billion stronger than it had been before. He blew up the uh, North America Free Trade Agreement. Conservatives were angry. They said, oh, he's not for free trade. I asked him about that. He said, the North America Free Trade Agreement is 17,000 pages long. That's the size of the Bible, 17,000 pages. It's filled with corruption. It doesn't take 17,000 pages to say free trade. So he blew it up and he rebuilt uh, the US, uh, Canada, Mexico agreement, which is much stronger. The Democrats like it better, Republicans like it better, Mexico likes it better, Canada likes it better. The only people that don't like it are the international of global companies that had their monopolies and were, were making money off of it. So that was typical of Donald Trump. He, he got in a lot of trouble politically because he took on the big monopolies that owned uh, the, the media. Viacom owns CBS, Disney owns ABC. Much of their profits are from China. So they don't like Donald Trump. So, so is that the real problem which he has with the media? I mean, I see on your page, on your website, all the interviews which you have uh, uh, given there are with the Fox television. But earlier presidents, you have been part of different, uh, you know, media outlet is speaking there and talking about it. But it seems that when it came to President Trump, the only outlet you had was Fox television. So, so describe to me, is the way media is uh, divided between uh, two sides? And uh, uh, I mean, I'm hearing you and our purpose is to uh, understand, are the experts also being divided that if you're an expert of one side, you go to only that particular media? Well, I will go anywhere, and I was on all of the channels, NBC, ABC, CBS in the United States, all the time. When uh, Barack Obama was inaugurated president, CBS had me on, and Katie Couric interviewed me to make commentary. But with the rise of Donald Trump, he he made uh, he made an important decision that dramatically impacted the economy of the United States, but hurt himself politically. He deregulated, he, he eliminated many of the regulations. It's these regulations that assure monopolies and create monopolies. Monopolies want regulations. The more regulations they are, they can handle them. They can pay for them. They, they can take care of them. If there's new regulations, they have the money to do it. But if you start your own business as a small business person, you can't afford to pay for all, to keep all those regulations. You can't even hire the attorneys to read the regulations. There are thousands of pages of regulations. I read somewhere that the stack of regulations for opening manufacturing in the United States is the size of a six story building. You can't afford to pay lawyers to even read through those regulations, let alone keep them. So when Donald Trump came into office, he deregulated and that unleashed these angels of small business. It allowed a mom and pop uh, donut shop to emerge where it, it, they couldn't afford to do it before. And it would be just the, the, the large chains, Dunkin' Donuts could afford it, but, but not you. You and your wife could not open a donut shop. McDonald's could afford it, but not you and your wife. You couldn't afford a hamburger joint. The monopolies get money from the Federal Reserve, sometimes directly, not even through a bank. You know what their interest rate is? Zero. When you go to the bank, you have to give interest. Zero percent interest when it comes from the Federal Reserve. They use the Import-Export Bank. And all of these big companies sponsor the national media. NBC Evening News brought to you by McDonald's. So the national media is paid for. The experts you see on TV, they work for think tanks. They get paid salaries. They're commissioned to write papers. They get paid for their papers. All that money comes from the large monopolies. 
And let, me just, let me ask you another question, uh, but uh, we'll take a short break uh, uh, before we get into that. You're watching Muslim Network TV, and we have presidential uh, historian uh, Doug Wheat, and this is Imam Malik Mujahid, and we'll be right back after these messages. My wife, who uh, she's a professor at the University of Cincinnati, who, who's Catholic, and by her watching and listening to our three-year-old son uh, watch Adam's World, she ended up taking Kalima Shahada. She embraced Islam because she learned so much about Islam and the other prophets. It really affected our life in a great way, and because of uh, Sound Vision and Adam's World, we're Muslims. I took my Shahada 15 years ago, and I actually am from a rural part of Ohio. And so I found the catalog for Sound Vision, and I ordered the the tapes and the CDs and the books, and I used those, and especially for my little daughter, you know, that's how we basically learned our Islam and Islam entered our hearts through the wonderful works of, of Sound Vision. Okay, Assalamu alaikum, brother. I just want you to know that I love the Sound Vision website, that a lot of times when I'm looking for information, especially as it relates to homelessness, domestic violence, and women issues, I go to that website, and then I see what you've written, and then I copy and paste it, and spread the word, because the wisdom is there, so I can't you know, I can't do any better than what Sound Vision has already done. Sound Vision is our survival uh, uh, guide. It is the uh, organization that provides skills for Muslims how to survive and thrive in this uh, community here in the U.S. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Anam, I'm in 11th grade, and I grew up with Adam's World, and what it taught me was unity, respect, and love for the Muslim Ummah. Is Adam's World is the greatest show ever made. Take me to the Kaaba, man. <laughs> I love that puppet. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and we're talking with uh, Doug Wheat, who's a presidential historian. Um, in the early period of uh, President Trump, uh, when there was a little bit of a fight uh, in the White House with uh, Bannon and uh, Steve Miller or some other people, I don't know who were they. So Henry Kissinger, a former Secretary of State commented, this is a fight between Jews and Christian in the White House. Did you read that? And what do you think uh, he meant by this? Hmm, I'm very curious about that. I, I, I don't know what he meant by that. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah I, I couldn't tell you. I did know and I interviewed Jared Kushner and Ivanka Kushner. They're Jewish, as you know. They lit the candles on a Friday night uh, in the Lincoln bedroom, which was the first time that had ever been done in the White House. Uh, but <coughs> I found them to be very, uh, very kind toward the Islamic world and uh, 
pardon me. <coughs> I've traveled all over the Islamic world. I've uh, been to Tehran and Amman and uh, every year for about 15 years, I would go to Jakarta and Surabaya and Medan and Kuala Lumpur and uh, places in Russia, Kassan and Almaty and Astana in Kazakhstan. So I have many, many Islamic friends. Well, I, we will talk about that in some other show. Right now, let's focus on America. Yeah. Tell me about the loyalty and freedom for vice presidents as they work. Well, a vice president's power comes only from the president. And people who describe a vice president as powerful, like they write books about Dick Cheney and say Dick Cheney really ran the war. He was extremely powerful. That is not true. And people may want to get in an argument with me, but I know George W. Bush extremely well. He was very proud of his pick of Dick Cheney as vice president. His father had picked Dan Quayle as vice president. Some felt that it was not a strong decision. So the son, who was competitive with his father, he loved the fact he picked Dick Cheney. He would call me on the phone and say, what do you think of my vice president? So he was pleased to give Dick Cheney power. And he was pleased that newspaper stories said, oh, Dick Cheney's really running things. That, that thrilled the president. When it got a little too much, he cut it off. And, and it ended because mm -hmm. the vice president has no constitutional authority mm -hmm. other than presiding over the Senate. This coming vice president may have some power because she's yeah. the deciding vote, but it's very, it's only what the president gives them. Uh, Walter Mondale was given power by Jimmy Carter and yeah. Dick Cheney by George yeah. W. Bush. Uh, please tell me, I'm going to give you a name of uh, uh, maybe two, three presidents and tell me one great thing about them and one bad thing about them. George <laughs> H. W. Bush. <laughs> a great thing about him, he's very funny, he's got a great sense of humor, and he's very decisive. He makes very quick decisions, and he never looks back. And that is also his weakness. He's very decisive, he makes quick decisions. And when he decided the war in Iraq, I knew before he was elected president, I told my wife when I saw he was leading in the polls, I said, if he's elected president, we will go to war with Saddam Hussein. And we will kill Saddam Hussein and we will kill his two sons. I said that before he was elected president because Saddam Hussein had ordered the assassination of his father. I, I guess I guess you're, uh, uh, I, I'm talking about George H.W. Bush. Oh. George H.W. Bush, so good quality and bad quality, just the opposite. Whereas his son was very decisive, George H.W. Bush was very deliberate and very careful and very cautious in his decision-making. That was a strength. You can see that in Iraq, in the war in Iraq, people said, why did he leave Saddam Hussein standing? Why didn't he finish him off? What's wrong with him? You see the wisdom of it now because the whole equilibrium of the Middle East was disturbed. And George H.W. Bush knew why it was important. Just leave Saddam alone. So there is, uh, that's his strength. That's also his weakness, is that he, he kept, uh, he'd worry about a decision even after he'd already made the decision. And uh, it, I guess it's true with all of us, our strengths are sometimes our weaknesses. Uh, tell us about Barack Obama. What was his strength? What was his weakness? Well, <laughs> the great thing about Barack Obama is he was the first African-American elected as president, and that will forever endear him in history as uh, a great president. The, the disappointment was, uh, again, the rise of globalism and the monopolies. Uh, that accelerated greatly under Barack Obama. An example is the stimulus bill. I never understood this before. It took me 40 years in government and politics to understand it. They pass all these regulations, environmental regulations, other regulations. Everybody has to keep them. 
It keeps the small businesses from competing. Then there's an economic crisis, as there was when Barack Obama was elected president. And they go to the lobbyists and Don't they say, you think it was there uh, during the uh, President Bush, which continued under Barack Obama? Yes, it was. But Barack Obama then becomes president. He's got to do something. So he goes to the lobbyists and says, what can we do to create jobs? These lobbyists represent the big corporations. Is there anything we can do, any legislation we can pass so you can start hiring again and we can get this economy recovered from the recession? And that's when they pass what's called a stimulus bill. And the stimulus bill, Barack Obama's stimulus bill, for example, was 1,000 pages long. Imagine that. And inside the stimulus bill, it exempts these big corporations from all the regulations that they had to keep in order to create jobs. Because the, the lobbyists said, you want us to create jobs? We need help. We, you've got all these tough regulations. Give us a 10-year period before we have to keep them and now, postpone tell, tell them. Tell us about, uh, you know, you gave us the strengths which you consider to be Donald Trump's. What was his major weakness? For Donald Trump? Yes. Oh, well. In your eyes, not in the eyes of somebody else. He, he's spontaneous and... Uh, it's both his strength and his weakness. He doesn't think things through, and that got him in trouble. And it was also okay. an advantage. About time. presidential libraries, I visited uh, uh, President uh, Bush the first uh, library, and it was uh, not in a very good shape in College Station in Texas. And uh, uh, I visited President Clinton's library, which was uh, look far better. But when I tried to access some material, it turned out there are a lot of restrictions. And so what purpose presidential library serve? Which library in your eyes is the best one? Well, presidential libraries are a monument to the president. For example, I've written more than a thousand pages of memorandum to George H.W. Bush. But none of them are in the presidential library. Why? The most important, because they, they were too sensitive. So in the first place, I was told not to address it to the president. So it would be memorandum, uh, building a relationship with the Islamic world. That may be the title of the memorandum. It would nowhere have the president's name on it. It would go to his personal secretary. She'd walk it in. I'd know that the president would see it because it would come back to me with little handwritten notes. What about this? What about that? So I could, I could go in my archives here and pull out a drawer and show you a memo that the president had obviously read because his hand scrawl is on the memo. But that would appear you nowhere. Think the presidential libraries essentially incomplete record of their presidency. Then. No, they aren't. They aren't. If if I work when I worked in the White House, if I wrote a memo to the president, it was stamped. The president has seen. Once that stamp came down, it's an official document of the U.S. government. It's owned by the government, and in 20 years or whatever it is, 30 years, it'll be public. Those are the documents that go back to the presidential library. And that's why they have restrictions on what you can see. But the good stuff isn't going to go back there. The good stuff will never be put in a memo. Why? Because when I wrote a memo to the president and it wasn't official, nobody would see it. If it was official, it would become public. And there are things I don't want to say that are going to be made public that I think the president needs to hear. So the best presidential libraries are the old ones. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> years ago, uh, that's your best chance of getting some uh, realistic appraisal of what's going on. Hmm. By the way, when George W. Bush became president, the first thing he did was extend the amount of time that a president can keep his documents private. I see. So 
Wow. So, so the, all the letters say, if people, I'm sitting here writing a letter to president, uh, here's what I think, this is what you need to do. Uh, that goes more or less in the garbage? <laughs> Not necessarily in the garbage, but uh, because it's currency, it's, it's important. But the media also decides what's important and they decide what they want and they cater to the presidents. If the presidents say, this is what I meant, the media will say, okay, yes, sir. Okay, that's what you meant. And they won't, they won't uh, uh, share a different opinion. If a scholar comes along and says, look at this handwritten note from the president, they'll say, oh, no, that's, they, they think like a group. And it takes many years before scholars emerge that will really take a look. You know that, you know that from history uh, of Asia and history of the Middle East and history of Europe and England. It's the same, it's no different than it is today. And the most important decisions made are made with a nod or a hum or a grunt. George W. Bush was good at that. I'd travel with him on the road and I'd say, do you want me to do this? And he'd say, hmm. I'd say, okay, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Is that okay? And he'd, hmm. He, I had to figure out what he wanted. And if I figured out wrong, I'd get in trouble. <laughs> but if I, if, I, if I did something I thought he wanted, uh, he'd communicate his pleasure, but he would never verbally say, I want you to say this, I want you to do this. Sometimes he would, but the most important things, the president, just like your boss at work, is just not going to commit. Mm. So you are in politics yourself, of course, you are partisan. And what, what is, you, you describe yourself a compassionate conservative. I know this term was used by President uh, Bush also. So what does a compassionate conservative means at this time? Well, I don't know, but I know what it meant to me. What it meant to me is my motivation is compassion. I'm for free enterprise, but I'm not for free enterprise to take advantage of people. I'm for free enterprise because I believe it will genuinely help people and work for people and that, that socialism has its limits. Uh, obviously, I believe in charity. That's how I, what I've done almost all my life. So. I raise money for the poor. I help the poor. I've been to displaced persons camps all over the world. And uh, I cared very deeply about the poor, but I believe the best solution for them when they can get on their feet is in a free society where they have opportunity, not in a society that dictates what they should believe and what they should think. So I call that compassionate conservatism. Tell me, I mean, you were part of the campaign for George H.W. Bush and worked with him. Why did he lose in the second term? Well, for one thing, he became cocky. He, he had a 92% approval rating, which is the highest approval rating any president had ever registered before since they'd started taking those polls. Can you imagine that? More than Obama. It reached the highest ever. And it was because of the Gulf War and his handling of the Gulf War at the time. And so America was united behind him. So that was one reason. There was another reason. He had Graves' disease and nobody really knew about it. It later became public. But at the time, suddenly, he was having three or four Rose, uh, Rose Garden events a day and Roosevelt Room meetings a day. and at least 10 or 15 or 20 events a day. We were very busy and suddenly that came to a halt. Partly it came to a halt because he was so popular he didn't think he needed to do the work, but it also came to a halt because he was ill. And it's ironic because he's the oldest living president in American history before he died, but he was ill in the last uh, years in the White House. Hmm. The main reason he lost it's because the parties were split into three and the Ross Perot ran against him. That's the main reason. Mm. Uh, 
you you know you you were part of the ron paul's campaign as well presidential campaign what type of person is ron paul and uh, why why what motivated you to join him i grew tired of what i saw and what i've described here as the corruption in washington most people who would call themselves compassionate conservatives they're conservative because they want money and they want the status quo protected and they're not compassionate towards people they just feel it's a good device to help them get votes so uh, I felt that both the Democrats and Republicans were wrong. And I saw Ron Paul in some debates. I thought, who is this guy? <laughs> How do they allow him in the debates? Because he was saying things that were true. And I thought, where did he come from? He said things I didn't agree with at all, but he said a lot of things that you don't say out loud in the United States. So I thought, you know, he doesn't have a chance to be president, but I'm going to support him because he's speaking the truth. He's trying to speak the truth, at least about money and the Federal Reserve and where the money comes from and how it's protected by the elite. And I'm going to support him. So that's why I got involved with uh, Ron Paul. And uh, well, then his you. son ran later. His son. Well, thank ran. you so much. I mean, you, your wife probably will have to write a book to spell out your secrets that what you have been <laughs> telling her before uh, before things happen. I'll take them to the grave. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. Well, thank you so much, Doug Reed. I mean, you have been very kind with your time and with your answers. Truly appreciate that. This is. Uh, uh, you know, you inspired, I hope, uh, many other people alongside myself to read what uh, you have written about our president's extraordinary excess, which you had. Do you think there is any other historian of presidency who has written as much or who has this much excess as you did? Well, I think there are many that have written more than I have and have greater scholarship uh, than I had because I came to it late. But uh, I don't know of any that know as many personal uh, friendships with the first families, the presidents and first ladies and children that I have had. In fact, I don't think anybody in history has ever interviewed as many of the first family members as I have. And that's not because I'm so great. It's just something that, that happened. <laughs> well. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we truly appreciate. And if you're kind enough, we'd like to have you back and we'll talk to you about uh, your uh, meeting with other leaders around the world uh, and comparing uh, how they operate, how their inner working is as compared to the working of American presidency. Thank you very much. As we have been talking with Doug Wheat, Doug Wheat is... Uh, was a New York Times bestseller author and an advisor to two American presidents. Uh, he has interviewed six presidents and first ladies, 19 of the president's children, and 12 presidential siblings and their parents, some of their parents as well. And thank you, Shweridil Khan, for producing today's show, and Dr. Abdul Wahid for assisting. And thank you for watching. You have been watching Muslim Network TV on Galaxy 19 Satellite and uh, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Raku. Uh, we are on uh, your iPhone or Android apps. Muslim Network TV is our website. And you can look for us on YouTube as well. Peace. Salam.